Hello and welcome to um, Lit Lunch Online for the Authors Club, our January lunch and our first one for 2021 has a great writer as our guest. She's an academic. She's a um, brilliant voice for why and how we need to think about um, humanities, education, human rights, well, life and culture in general. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome Lindsay Stonebridge. She is an award-winning scholar and professor of humanities and human rights at the University of Birmingham. This book, Writing and Writing, hopefully you can see it, um, is um, about literature in the age of human rights. And she's currently working on another book, which is on Thinking like Hannah Rent, and I want to know what that is about too. But first of all, welcome, Lindsay. Um, Thank you. In a normal circumstance, we do it around a table and um, over a glass of wine, but uh, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be with you, even in our little Zoom boxes. It's still great to be here. Thank you for asking me. So um, I, of course, read writing and writing earlier and I was very, very honoured and privileged to have a proof sent to me. And um, of course, what strikes me is how um, it articulates very, very complex ideas, very, very urgently, critically needed ideas in a really easy, very, very accessible way. Um, I'm hoping to have it for my um, undergrads on, on the syllabus next year. But um, I wanted to start with asking you, um, rather than me putting in, because I could keep talking about the book, what started off this book? It's a quite a slim volume, it's very, very tight, but every chapter really looks at some very complex debates that we've been having, often quite furiously and often quite violently in the past mm -hmm. few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, I'm really glad you think it's accessible because one of the kind of problems with literary criticism for the last 20 years has been it's kind of perceived inaccessibility and actually sometimes it's inaccessibility. And there's an answer to why it's inaccessible. There's two answers to why it's accessible. One is it came out of the classroom. Um, and as you'll know, because you're a teacher, what you do is you, you spend an awful lot of time communicating complex ideas in a way that bright people respond to, and that's the voice. So some of the first chapters came out of a course I was teaching back at the University of East Anglia, where I taught before I came to Birmingham, called Literature and Human Rights. And that was kind of quite academic. I mean, it was how how has literature helped big human rights movements? So a colleague taught the 18th century and I taught the 20th century. Um, so it was very scholarly, but the students, as they often are, were jibby and wanted more. Um, and what they were responding to is exactly what I responded to as a student, as I do as a scholar and a writer, is the sense that writing matters. It means that means something. It does things in the world. is really important. So that was half of it. And then what the same thing that happened is that as we were carefully kind of talking about and following how it was that you wouldn't have actually had modern human rights without writers without that vision, without finding new languages to describe injustices, without describing new languages for justice. And we can talk about you know, the different histories that come into that. But as we were exploring that and finding new vocabularies to talk about that in the classroom, human rights came under attack quite visibly. So whether it was the new nationalist international, um, the rise of the new right, the rise of nationalism, the rise of intolerance, and also that very blatant sense of it being cool not to like human rights, plus the so-called migrant crisis, plus, plus, plus. So you, you were in that kind of opposition of teaching something just as it was vanishing. So that you had, and at that point, like a lot of other people, I started to do more journalism. So the other reason why some of the book is accessible is that half the time I was writing up my notes for, from teaching and the other half I was writing up op-eds or pieces I'd done for the press. So it was very much a book about um, 
may, yes, having accessible ideas, but it's a very much born out of a sense of urgency that we need to kind of lay things back out on the table. So I have my students um, and my readers um, to thank for that accessibility, I think. Well, do you know, it really struck me, and, I, and I'm glad you just raised it, um, the idea that we wouldn't have human rights without, without writers. Um, and, you know, the Authors Club is a heritage institution founded 1891, but, and, and a whole parade of these writers who were key to forming our ideas around rights and writing. Um, have come through the doors. Um, one of my favorites is, of course, um, Emile Zola on fleeing Paris mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. denounces yeah. um, his own treatment as well as um, censorship of the state um, at the Authors Club mm -hmm. um, while protests at um, the censorship of Salome at the Authors Club. So there's a kind of, a, I kind of see this, and yet I agree with you. There's this, there's a really strange moment where I think a lot of writers even have somehow bought into this idea that writing is some kind of a fluffy, yeah. meaningless luxury, rather than something exactly as you said, writing matters, words matter mm. what we say. Mm -hmm. and this makes it really clear the book your book is really quite taught and very very committed to that idea that whatever we say has not only meaning but importance um if i were to say you know what was the key um moment or key point where you said no this needs to be explained and this mm. is why. What would be maybe one or two or maybe even three points you would say, this is why writing matters? Yeah. Well, I think some of that did come out of my scholarship, which was mid 20th century. So I'm a scholar, a literary historian of the mid 20th century. So I write about things like human, well, war crimes, the Holocaust, statelessness, atrocity and decolonization. And what I learned from those writers was that what writing can do is give a language and a framework to imagine injustice. Now that's a tradition that's been suppressed in recent um, popular culture. There's another idea which is writing is good because it creates empathy. And this is certainly true. I mean, you know, yes, it does. Um, but it also has a very, very long tradition. So if you think about, you know, the 18th century novel, which was all about showing us how servant girls and working class people later in the 19th century had subjectivities like us. Um, the novel yeah. was a great way of you know, showing, showing other people. I mean, I always say to my students, that really, if you need to read a novel to realize that there are other people like you in the world, you're not going to be great at human rights. I mean, I've got a low bar. But I think where writing gets, where writers are really good, it is finding new languages and forms with, with which to call an injustice an injustice to describe forms of atrocity. And forms of atrocity are always changing, right? You know, it's not like we are always horrible to each other, but there are specifically modern forms of atrocity. And one of my favorite quotes is from the, you know, the great Marxist writer, historian, Eric Hobsbawm. He said, well, the 20th century um, was so appalling in Europe um, that we had to name, we had to um, imagine new words to describe what we were doing to each other. And one of those words was genocide and the other was, word was um, statelessness. And by the time the 20th century, everyone thinks, okay, genocide is bad. <laughs> we think, um, we think, we're just about like, you know, we're still on that page. Um, statelessness, oh, well, maybe, you know, maybe we do need to control refugees and migrants. Maybe it's okay if we put them in camps. Maybe it's okay. We start saying that, we start saying, we start rationalizing what we're doing. And suddenly you've got kids losing their mind in the mud of Lesbos and Calais, and you're separating children and for their parents on the American border, which is an atrocity, but which took a kind of language and protest for people to kind of wake up to that. And Black Lives Matter would be another, you know, you know, so, so much of the good writing that's coming out of that moment is not about saying pity us or sympathize or look, we're human. It's saying, I'm gonna give you new terms with which to look at the world so you can see what you're doing and see what you're implicated in. 
Um, and writing, I mean, Zola is such a brilliant example of that because that that is what, you know, he's, he's you know, crafting a new realism, crafting a new voice, crafting a new imaginative form that went with his politics. Um, yeah. So this is, this is the world. So that I think really does need saying again. And it is again in, in, in kind of public discourse and in education discourse, the idea that writing is some kind of like social seasoning on top after you've done all the other stuff rather than the business of where one of the businesses of where we work out what it means to be human together yeah and as i say in the book we've lived with the consequences of that devaluation um i mean you can see it in, in um the pandemic i mean people keep on saying although you know the book trade's obviously having real challenges but people are reading people are reading more than they've ever before and people keep on saying um it's good that people can get distracted or, um, you know, have a retreat from the world. And I keep on saying, they're not getting distracted or entertaining themselves or running away from the world. They're trying to imagine what is happening when all the coordinates of the world have been smashed up. That's what people are doing when they're reading. You're, you know, people are reading to find out how to be a person in a world that you don't understand. That's what they do. That's, to me, I mean, you know, I still feel like a sort of 17 year old reading Zola for the first time. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> It's actually quite amazing, isn't it? This this idea that you you've just 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 said, you know, the uh, that we read to find ways to imagine ourselves, and I think that's been such a such an extraordinary moment um, now with the pandemic. And I know we are, you know, this is this is um, a sort of, you know, me looking for silver linings. But I think if we can walk away come out of the other side with having thought new things or new ways yeah. of being with each other that's a that wouldn't be a terrible thing at all mm. um I, I think one of the things that that i'm i'm kind of curious about is um and i suppose this is this is me asking you to think you know to give me some kind of a beam of light at this one um what how did we get to devalue what is as you said one of the essential businesses of a writer yeah. um, uh, there was there, there's a whole conversation around how um happening on you know social media conversation around how you know people want don't want issue-based writing and i i, I was mm -hmm. struck by that but i want to read something that hasn't got issues and i i, I looked at and I, I was like i can't remember a book i've ever read and i read everything from georgia tear to you know i i took my shot at trying to read um the various, you know, Harry Potters. I mean, I read anything and everything just to get a sense of it, because like you, I'm, I'm interested in, in not just literary culture, but popular culture. Um, and I was just looking at going, what is this thing that, that, that you speak of, this non-issue based writing? Mm. How did mm. somehow end up here? Because I think yeah. if I look at what we've, we've done in the last hundred something years, mm. I thought we were on the right path and it just feels yeah. like suddenly the world's been upended yeah yeah but i think it also also what's happened when um the kind of moral imagination got claimed by let's like, you know, say in, just in england but i think the same works for france a kind of liberal elite white guy um and so which is fine I mean, it's just, you know, my formation too. Um, but I think it was that sense that anything that falls out of, you know, the reasonable voice of Ian McCure is somehow issue-based. <laughs> like, um, well, it, it's not, you know, it, um, I mean, issues in far as like, how do I learn to die? How do I learn to grieve? When I might necessarily not have had to die at this point or grieve at this point. These are human questions, but they're always political and social questions yeah. at the same time. So that kind of, I mean, literature is part of the conversation we have with ourselves. It's part of a social conversation. You, I mean, people who read have voices in their head. Writers have loads of voices in their head. Probably most of us think we could well do with, few, with fewer. But that's really important because actually being in a political community is about having other voices in your head. Some of the voices you don't like. Some of the voices you don't like listening to. And where do we get to learn to do that? Quite often in a book. 
<laughs> like this to say. So that kind of, you know, I think the kind of issue based versus pure whatever is a confection. Um, I think you're quite right in that. But it's actually where do we start? And this is an important question of claiming back uh, a moral authority that we can collectively agree on. So if we know where that is transitioning, which is great um, and not so great because it's also terrifying, um, where, how can we kind of develop a political community that is both tolerant of difference and ambitious for its imagination and adds ambition for its, ambitious for its community. And I think reading and writing and not just novels, but poems, et cetera, et cetera, are ways of negotiating those things um, that are extraordinarily um, powerful, but they come from places where you don't, people won't recognize. I think that's the other thing. Um, and that's just, you I mean, you know this better than I, because you've done so much work. It's like, whose writing gets published? Who gets to be heard? Who gets to be, to have the moral authority? And there's a bit, I mean, there's a bit in the book where um, you might recall the first meeting after um, the Grenfell fire, um, the first council meeting that was held after that. One of the survivors gets up and is finally allowed to speak. Um, and she quotes in Persian, um, Sadi, you know, the, the Nightingale of Shiraz, Shiraz um, you know, the great Persian poet. She quotes the great Rose Garden um, to deliver a message about human equality under suffering. Um, and there it is, there's literature right in the middle of this human political social catastrophe. Yeah. Delivering a lesson about rights and equality. And then there's an even better moment, her translator, because she speaks, she, 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 she speaks in Persian. Her translator very kindly explains to the um, counselors that you can compare Saadi's poem to John Donne's um, No Man is an yeah. Island. So it, we have yeah. you know, world literature, we have Persian literature, we have English literature. There's, a, there's an English literature lesson going on right in the middle of Kensington. <laughs> Um, council at this extraordinary moment. You think, well, you know, it's not just because it's, you know, the usual writer in The Guardian, read, who everyone's reading on a Saturday review, which makes us feel nice and is great and is genuine and inventive. Literature is happening all these places. It's happening all the time. And, and that, I feel, is like, we need, we need to pay attention to, you know, the, the political and social, cultural life of literature that's happening outside the normal yeah. um, established bastions um, it's it's actually quite funny because one of the words um one of the ways i wanted to that i've grown to describe your book writing and writing is that it's um it's almost a love letter yeah it's a love letter to literature to books because it's like well we need this and it's it's, yeah. it's a real explanation of of not and, and i think it's interesting you said about you know how literary criticism has kind of grown more opaque and inaccessible and I think your book does that because I think what it does is is clarify that as you say literature matters literature is happening constantly in these places and that everything and that we do is is in some ways a constant love relationship yeah. It's kind of ongoing marriage mm. with um, writing going across the globe and across time. And it's it's, it's quite extraordinary to, to be able to think of it that way. Of course, as a writer, I mean, I'm here for anybody writing love letters to literature. Yeah. Because I always feel like, you know, I'm always saying, please read, please read more. So it's really important. But I think I, I think that is that is so I think we need that set out so often. And I have to say, as a writer, I was. Um, I was very comforted <laughs> to, to, to have somebody say it out loud rather than me. So yeah. Going, please, please pay attention. Um, but I think that also nicely brings us to something that you've, you're now working on, on Hannah. Right. And um, like many people from the former colonies, like many people who um, are not white, my relationship with Arendt is, is let's say, a complex one. Mm -hmm. Really, you've mentioned her in the book, in, in writing and writing, and I so I want to sort of think about where you're going with it. 
Mm-hmm. Because it's, 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 it's a tough one. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it is. I mean, I just want to go back to the love thing because I, I've often, I often thought of that book as a love letter to literature, but I, thought, I, can't, I don't dare say it because, you know, I like to think I'm quite cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. I, I, mean, I was trained in literary theory, in like Polonek, and you know, my mates think I'm cool. Um, and um, so, but I knew secretly it was my love letter to literature. So I, so I've obviously failed to be cool and to and, and not to disguise that. But it does actually come back to some of. I mean, there are writers. I mean, Freud is another one. Arendt is another one for me, who I have a really intimate relationship with, and that is a kind of a kind of love. Um, but it's a kind of um, rebellious love as well. I mean, um, so Arendt, you know, there's lots I identify with, the stroppiness I identify with, I identify massively with a sense of always looking in on the outside. Um, and there's a debate about how far she was actually on the outside by the end of her life, but certainly for a lot of it, she, she, she was. Um, and what comes with that, because you know, when she, she, you know, she deliberately did not become an academic. She deliberately was not a philosopher or, or quite a political theorist. She writes about literature all the time. She's constantly trying to find um, an account and a language of the world, which she knows is both hers because she loves it and then not at all hers. So, so that, I think, I think that makes her a good commentator for the now, but. Um, there are moments where I'm trying to write about her writing on Little Rock. This week of all weeks, I'm trying to write about her um, writing on Little Rock, um, which, you know, usually a rent skirt sort of go, mm, yes, well, mm. <laughs> um, and, it, and it's just like, you know, how careless, how lazy, this sort of offends me as a scholar apart from anything else, apart from the, the casual um, racism, is how, how lazy can you be? How... Mm. But I think actually that goes back to what it means to be a critic and a writer. You're always in antagonistic dialogue with your love objects uh, as, as, as well as anything else. Um, and there's, you know, there's a kind of honesty that's involved that Arendt does preach and does do and does fail at. So I'm try- what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to rescue her from a kind of you know, American critical theory box. I'm trying to rescue her from the kind of slightly unfortunate reputation she got after Trump as the great analyst of American fascism, which she wasn't. I mean, her description of fascism and totalitarianism is entirely to do with Europe. Um, She could see what was happening in the US, but she was not the best commentator on on that. But where I think, and I made this point in a book I published a couple of years ago called Placeless People, where she was absolutely right, was about statelessness, nation state, the wreck of capitalist colonialism and what and how that had produced totalitarianism and how that had produced a set of political, ethical and historical questions that we're still working out. And it, it is that it's the position of the, the rent the refugee, rent the stateless person, where she is at her strongest. And that's that's the voice I'm interested in um, putting out again. But I quarrel with her. Um, and that, that's good. I mean, I, I, today I was, no, over the weekend I was thinking, there's a bit, what I really like about her is her, is her sarcasm and her realism. She always says, you have to face up to reality and reality is not the way you like it. And she's anti-piety. And there's a bit of me, you know, you know most writers are anti-piety because otherwise you just write, you know, bloody shopping list on nicest. We're all, we're all quite naughty, otherwise we wouldn't have to be secret about what we do half the time. Um, I love all that. And I love her realism. And I was thinking, God, I wish Arendt had read Claudia Rankin. I just wish, because Rankin also, what is so brilliant about Rankin as a writer and a scholar is she will not stop. Yeah. Um, she is she is going to tell you how it is and footnote it and references. And she's going to keep on doing it. And she's not having any bullshit. And she's finding a language to do that. Um, you know, and, and in some ways, she, the, the, her and Arendt are mirror images of each other, it's just say you're not going to get away with any of this yep. liberal nice nonsense because this is what's going. This is the reality of interracial friendship. Actually, you know, you don't get to transcend racial and political violence just because you think you're nice. Um, you, you've you've got harder, harder, harder work to do here. 
So yeah, so just as we kind of think, God, can I, can I just want this chapter to be imaginary conversation between Claudia Rankin and Hannah Arendt. Claudia Rankin, of course, is no reason why she should have a conversation with Hannah Arendt at all. <laughs> but, um, it's, so is that kind of thing, is that kind of, yes, you have to get into a dialogue, but what the writers I really admire do, they do happen to be women a lot, um, is that kind of telling hard truths, but finding ways to do it, not finding ways to do it that make it nicer either. This is difficult. Yeah. yeah. It's quite strange, isn't it? Because both of them, I wouldn't have necessarily thought about putting the two together. But no, I didn't until this weekend. But also, I think one of the things they also share is, is this incredibly, incredibly elegant prose. Yes. And, and that always, um, I mean, just, just keeps me going um, with a rent, even though I don't, I have a complicated relationship, definitely. But mm -hmm. um, thank you um, for talking to us. It, we had planned this for a while and it's um, after the events of this month and well, hopefully no more drama. I think it's become even more urgent and more pertinent. So yeah. thank you for joining us. Um, this is Lindsay's book, Writing and Writing, Literature in the Age of Human Rights. I can not recommend this highly enough. This is a, the must read for 2021 and after. So please go do so. And thank you, Lindsay. No, thank you.